retired pastor from uh, Independence, Kentucky. He's going to preach on drinking Christ's blood. Turn, if you will, to the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter. Our ever blessed Lord and Savior Jesus Christ preached this sermon on the bread of life to those who sought him for physical bread. Toward the end of the sermon, he began to use parabolic language. The word parable or parabolic means to lay down beside so as to invite comparison. And you see his purpose in doing this. In verse 53, then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. It is my belief that Christ used this language to illustrate what it means to trust in him. And the Bible is very clear in teaching that we are saved by faith. First of all, in dealing with our Lord's parabolic speech, I would like to rebuke the sacramentalism that has been based upon these words. As you are aware, the Roman Catholic Church teaches the doctrine of the Mass in which they teach that the bread and wine is turned into the literal body and blood of Christ and is then consumed and eternal life is brought about in this way. I might mention in rebuking this crass sacramentalism that first of all our Lord explained that, that very night in John 16 25 that he was using parabolic language in the King James Bible it uh, doesn't say the word parable. Uh, in fact, let me turn there. My mind has slipped as to exactly the terminology he used. John 16 and verse 25, he said, These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. But if you look in a Greek New Testament, you'll see that the word is parable. And so he was using parabolic language. And this was the same night that he said, Take, eat, this is my body and this is my blood. It was that very evening that he mentioned that he was using parabolic language. Christ asserted his meaning before he illustrated it with this parabolic language. Look, if you will, in John 6 and verse 33. This is the same sermon that I have just read out of. And he said in John 6, 33, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. They said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Now notice, and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. What could be more clear? Uh, how do you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man? By faith. In verse 47, in the same sermon, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life, I am the bread of life. Augustine, who is mentioned as one of the doctors of the Roman Catholic Church, made this statement. He said, believe, and thou hast eaten. Now, if you ever spoke the truth, that was the truth. Believe, and thou hast eaten. Also, we know that this is according to the analogy of faith. You never interpret scripture to contradict scripture. Amen. Jesus explained that we're to receive everlasting life by faith. And then when he mentioned eating Christ's uh, flesh and drinking his blood as the way of life, that is to be taken as parabolic for faith. And that is according to the analogy of faith. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When Paul was asked in Acts 16, verse 31, what must I do to be saved? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. 
I might go on to say that the mass contradicts Old Testament law. Uh, this is something to consider in Acts 17, and this has already been read. But God said to the nation of Israel, And whatsoever man there be of the nation of Israel, or the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among the people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh atonement. And he said, Therefore I said unto you, unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. Now, it's hard for me to believe that our Lord would enjoin them to do what he had expressly forbidden in the Old Testament for men to do, Amen. and that is to eat blood. In fact, let me say this. Had our Lord literally commanded them to eat blood, there is no doubt that there would have been a debate about it in the Jerusalem church. Because the Jerusalem church, the first church, was made up wholly of Jews. And the idea that they would have gathered together and drank blood and ate flesh without there being a debate about it. In fact, years later at the Jerusalem council, when they were sending advice to the Gentile Christians, one of the bits of advice that they sent in Acts 15 verse 29 was not to eat blood. And so, again, I say it's inconceivable to those who think about it that Christ would have commanded them to literally eat blood or drink blood and that they would have done it without some sort of a debate. Christ's speech reveals his knowledge of his listeners' understanding. At the Last Supper, in Matthew 26 and verse 28, he took the cup and he said, This is my blood. In the very next verse, he referred to it as the fruit of the vine, which shows that he understood that they knew exactly what he was saying, that they did not literally think that he was referring uh, to his literal blood. They were used to this. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Life is in the gospel, not in the gospel memorial. Uh, our Lord said this in John 6 and verse 63. He said, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. Jesus said, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Let me say this, in a true church, in the center of that church, there's a pulpit. And people are saved through the preaching of the gospel. The words that I speak unto thee, they are spirit and they are life. It is in the synagogue of Satan that you find an altar in the center of the church. Our altar is Calvary. And there on the altar of the cross, he gave his life for us. And you say, Brother Ron, what do we do? We preach it. We proclaim it. The words that I speak unto thee. There could be no ordinances if there were no gospel. You know, the gospel is like the moon. You'd never know the moon was there if it weren't for the sun. The moon only reflects the light of the sun. Where there is no gospel preaching, there can be no baptism. Where there is no gospel preaching, there can be no Lord's Supper. For those are ordinances and pictures. And where the real thing is not there, the picture and the memorial could not exist. And so life is in the gospel, not in the memorial. I had somebody say to me one time, they attended the church, and they said, well, in our church we worship God, in your church you preach. I don't know anything greater, any greater act of worship than to listen to the words of the Almighty. Oh, earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the gospel. And the Bible says, hear, and thy soul shall live. And so it is in the preaching of the gospel that people come to know Christ and to receive him. And then Christ asked to be remembered, not offered. In Luke 22 and verse 19, he said, this do in remembrance of me. 
the Roman Catholic Church teaches that the Mass is an ongoing sacrifice, that the work of Christ is not finished. We, however, rejoice in a finished salvation. Amen. Listen to these words from the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 9, 25. Not yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sin of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And then in chapter 10, verse 10 and 12, in verse 10 he said, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. Verse 12, But this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that every time the Mass is observed that Christ is offered anew. Christ was offered once. You know, there was all sorts of paraphernalia in the tabernacle. There was one piece of furniture that was not there. It was a chair. No one ever sat down because no one was ever finished. It was repetition and repetition and repetition. But when Christ died on the cross, before he gave up his, the ghost, he said, it is finished. And when he ascended to the right hand of God, he sat down. The mass right raises Christ from his throne. It revokes his cry, it is finished. It distorts his intercession. Christ died once. Every day, his presence in heaven is a presentation of what he has done. Not an offering, but a remembrance. One of the things, and I don't say this to be critical, but Oftentimes in our music and even in our preaching, we'll speak of the nail-scarred hands. Do you ever think of how incorrect that is? There are no scars in the hands of Christ. In Revelation chapter 5, it says, I saw a lamb as it had been slain. Those words connote that Christ in heaven, that those wounds are not scars that have healed, that they're open wounds. It's an ongoing thing. I saw a lamb as it had been slain. In other words, the remembrance of Christ's death is fresh. He's never re-offered. But the memory of what took place on Calvary is ongoing. That's the intercessory work of Christ. It is not subjective. It is not Christ running before the Father uh, saying, uh, Lord, I know they sinned, but forgive them. That's not, that's not the intercessory work of Christ. The intercessory work of Christ is, I saw a lamb as it had been slain. His presence in heaven is a constant reminder of what he did on Calvary's cross. But the mass would rise him, make him uh, to raise again from his throne in heaven. But he's seated at the right hand because it's finished. And when he cried, it is finished, it really was finished. And as he is in heaven tonight, his presence is a remembrance of the fact that our sins were put away. Now this brings us to the part of the sermon that I like to preach about. First of all, the nature of saving faith illustrated. Christ, in talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, was giving us a picture of what it means to receive Christ and what it means to believe in him. We as human beings use illustrations to understand. Spurgeon always encouraged young preachers to use illustrations. He said illustrations like a window, it lets the light in. I remember as a child hearing an illustration. A missionary had gone to a foreign country to preach the gospel and he was, he was attempting to translate the scriptures into their language. Well, some languages are very poor and it's hard to translate the scripture into those languages. One of the words that he was having trouble finding was the word faith. I mean, what an important word that is in the Holy Scripture, but he couldn't 
find a word in that language that would adequately translate faith. And he thought about it, and days went on, and he moped about it and prayed about it and uh, tried his best to come up with some word that would be equivalent. One day when he had almost given up, he saw a man laying in a hammock. And something flipped on in his mind, and he thought, well, that's what it is to trust in Christ, to recline on him, to rest on him. And he ran up to that man and he said, well, what is the word for what you're doing? And the man in that language said, well, I'm reclining. And so he went to John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever reclineth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. As the New Testament defines faith, it speaks of it as a coming to Christ. My Christ is in heaven. We couldn't get here without a GPS. I wouldn't know how to get to heaven, but I know how to come to Christ. You say, how? By faith. The Bible speaks of accepting Christ. The gospel is worthy of all acceptation. That's to acknowledge it as true. The Bible speaks of receiving Christ. The Bible speaks of fleeing to Christ. You know, that language comes from the cities of refuge in the Old Testament. If you were out chopping down a tree and the axe head fell, flew off that axe and hit the person next to you and killed them, it was the job of their nearest of kin to kill you. And you better get out of there. And the only place you were safe was in the cities of refuge. And you would run to the nearest city of refuge. You, you wouldn't lollygag. You wouldn't traipse down that trail. You'd run. You'd flee because if he caught up with you, you were a dead man. And it was the job of those cities to keep the way to the cities of refuge. They were to keep the obstacles. You say, Brother Ron, you're preaching tonight about the mass and criticizing those ideas. Why are you doing that? I'm trying to get the junk out of the way of sinners. Amen. To keep the way to the city of refuge. You know, you can't let a lot of sacramentalism and religious junk pile up in the road. Amen. The avenger is on their trail. If you're here tonight without Christ, the Avenger's on your trail. And you better flee to Christ. You say, well, I'll get there by and by. That's what Lot's wife thought. That's why the Savior said, remember Lot's wife. That's where traips and the Savior will get you. The Bible speaks of Christ as, or faith in Christ as a looking. Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be ye saved. The Bible speaks of faith in Christ as a committing. If you commit your money to the bank, you're trusting them to take care of it. When you commit your soul to Christ and trust in him for the forgiveness of sins, you're trusting in him. And then to eat. What it is, and we know very little about this, but what it is to be hungry. What it is to be thirsty. Remember hearing a soldier talk about being in a position where he was so thirsty and he had to stand and look at these uh, large containers of water while it was being served and it took hours for everybody to get a drink. And every cell in your body crying out for moisture. Maybe there's somebody here today and you say, I don't know what it is to trust Christ. Do you know what it is to come to somebody for help? Do you know what it is to accept the truth? Do you know what it is to receive a gift? Do you know what it is to flee when you're afraid? Do you know what it is to look to one that can help you when you're drowning? Do you know what it is to commit something to someone you trust? Do you know what it is to eat when you're hungry? To drink when you're thirsty? And so the nature of saving faith is illustrated in these ways. Now finally, I'd like to answer the question, why is faith the soul saving act. Now somebody might say, Brother Ron, when you use the word soul, are you spelling that S-O-L-E or S-O-U-L? Both. It'll fit both ways. Faith is the soul saving act. It is the one thing that will bring you the forgiveness of sins. It's also the soul saving act. 
It's a thing that will save your soul. You say, Brother Ron, why is faith the soul-saving act? Well, there's several reasons that I'll give you. First of all, because faith alone is consistent with salvation by grace. Paul plainly asserts this in Romans chapter 4 and verse 16. Romans 4 and verse 16, he says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. Now, aren't those important words? It's of faith. Paul, why is it of faith? That it might be by grace. If it were received in any manner other than by faith, it would end up contradicting the concept of grace. If God said, I've done it all, my son has paid for sins, I'm going to save you by my grace, now all you have to do is keep the Ten Commandments. That's not grace. It's a faith that it might be by grace. You know, I've used this illustration. There's some things I have two of. I have two eyes, two hands, and two lungs, and two kidneys. Now, I'm kind of partial to them. But if you really needed them and you couldn't live without them and I gave you one of my eyes and one of my kidneys and one of my lungs, I'd think that was a real sacrifice on my part. And if you came up and said, Brother Ron, I really appreciate all you've done, and I'd like to give you this 10 cents, I'd say, I don't want your 10 cents. I want you to understand. I want you to appreciate. You know, people offer their 10 cents to God. He, don't, he doesn't want your 10 cents. He wants you to trust his son. He wants you to bow the knee to him. He wants you to give all the glory to him. I had a Camelite say to me one time, he said, well, you know, the Bible says, now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three, and the greatest of these is charity. He said, why would salvation be by faith when love is a more important grace than charity? And I said, well, I want you to stop and think. In the book of Romans, the Bible says, love is the fulfilling of the law. What does the first table of the commandments teach us? Love God with all your heart. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And uh, thou shalt not make any of the engraven images. And what, what are all those verses telling us? Love God with all your heart. When the Bible says you're not to bear false witness or not to commit adultery or not to kill, what's it telling you? Love your neighbor as yourself. So when somebody says, why isn't salvation by love? Because love is nothing but law. If you were saved by love, basically you would be saved by keeping the Ten Commandments. Basically you'd be saving yourself. Basically if you could be saved by law, that would be nothing but personal perfection, which none of us have. No, you're saved as a sinner, and the only way a sinner can be saved, and that's by faith in Jesus Christ. And then... Faith is the soul-saving act because faith alone brings sureness. Notice what Paul said in verse 16. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. I'd like to ask you a question. Is there any gospel or any false gospel that teaches any way of salvation other than faith where people are sure. People that claim to be saved by baptism, are they sure? Never. People that claim to be saved by the sacraments, are they sure? Never. Who is it that sings, I've got a mansion over the hilltop? It's people that believe that you're saved by grace through faith. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Faith alone credits its object. You know, faith doesn't take credit to itself. It gives credit to the one that it trusts. I have eight grandchildren, and they're precious. And my son has three little blonde-haired boys, and they're just as cute as they can be. And the oldest one is named Noah. And uh, we live in a two-story house. I, I was at the top of the stairs with Noah, and he's just, uh, well, I, not much on knowing how old children are, but uh, two or three. Uh, 
And uh, I had a little uh, laser pointer. He had put a little red dot of light on the wall. And he was up there, and I said, forgive me. I said, I was here the other day, and there must have been a fairy down there or something. And he said, what? And I, he was in front of me, and I turned that laser lighter on. It was uh, dark down the bottom stairs, and that little red light started going out, and his eyes got just as big. And then I turned it, and that light gradually started coming up the stairs towards him. Well, he turned around and grabbed me by the leg. And I turned it off. I said, let's go downstairs now. And he said, Grandpa, will you carry me down? You say, now, Brother Ron, that was terrible. Why would you do that? <laughs> so that he would say, Grandpa, would you carry me down? <laughs> You see, he wasn't saying, Dad, I'm, Grandpa, I'm brave. He wasn't saying, Grandpa, I'm strong. He was saying, Grandpa, will you carry me down? You say, what is that? That's faith in Grandpa. And who was receiving the credit there? Grandpa was. And faith never receives credit. It ascribes credit. It never claims strength. It ascribes strength. It never claims ability, it ascribes ability. And so faith credits its object. And then faith engages the whole heart. Paul said in Romans 10, 10, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. I was preaching down in Laplace, Louisiana, and two ladies came in. They, it was obvious they'd never been in church before. And I was reading the words of Christ where he talked about having to leave father and mother, homes and land. And one of them turned to the other and whispered, but they whispered so loud you could hear it all over the building. He said, I hope we don't have to get rid of our house to join the church. And they came up afterwards. They wanted to know what they had to do to go to heaven. And I explained to them that we were sinners and that we were not deserving of heaven but that it would come to us as a gift to those who repented of their sins and trusted in Christ. Well, they didn't want it that way. They wanted it. In fact, I believe if I'd said you have to give up your house, they'd have, they'd have took that. But they wouldn't come to Christ and take it as a free gift. Not long after that, I was knocking on doors, going door to door in Reserve, Louisiana, which is right on the Mississippi River there, right in the river parishes and I knocked on the door and a man came to the door and I began to talk to him about Christ and I told him that you're saved by faith he said I don't want that kind of salvation I want real salvation where you have to do something and I tried to explain to him this and this is the thing that people don't understand you can sit in church till you wear the pew out and your mind be anywhere in this universe. You could swim the Atlantic Ocean to earn salvation, and you'd be thinking about the sharks and the crabs, and if you got near the side of Europe, you'd be thinking, if anybody deserves it, I deserve it. But when the Spirit of God convicts a man of his lost condition and produces poverty of spirit, that reaches deeper into the heart than any sacrament, than any act of self-righteousness could ever do. You may swim the Atlantic, but your heart will never be touched. And with your whole man, you'll never look to Christ like the publican who would not so much as lift his eyes to heaven, but smote his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the man that spent his life in church has never appreciated Christ like the thief that hung upon, hung upon the cross. And that very morning he'd been blaspheming the Son of God, but through the miracle of grace, he looked that afternoon to the Savior and said, this man hath done nothing amiss. We deserve what we're getting. But he looked to the Savior and he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And the Son of God said this day, shalt thou be with me in paradise. People say, I want a religion where you've got to do something. God wants a religion where he has your heart. And the Bible says, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. Faith is ongoing. 
the person who has trusted in Christ is truly trusted in Christ is the person who is trusting in Christ. And the true Christian goes to heaven trusting in Christ. I often say, people say, did anybody believe in Christ this morning? I always say, well, I did. You know, we love the gospel as Christians more than anybody. I mean, the gospel goes out to the lost, but we don't get tired of hearing the gospel because we continue to trust Christ. Faith establishes the proper spirit for Christian service. We don't serve God out of fear. We don't serve God out of self-righteousness. We serve God out of love. But you say, how does that work? The Bible says, faith which worketh by love in the book of Galatians. Let me conclude by saying this. We're not saved in the baptistry. We're not saved at the communion table. We don't drink Christ's blood and eat his flesh in a crassly, literal way. But knowing that the life of the flesh is in the blood and knowing that his blood was shed for us, we trust in him. And knowing that each wound in that blessed body was a door to heaven, we eat his flesh by faith. I read a story about a lifeguard and somebody was drowning and it's horrible to see. There's something about drowning and it's just awful. And the lifeguard stood there and he watched that man. And the man was trying to save himself and he was thrashing around awfully. And finally, he wore himself out and gave up and he began to sink. And that minute, the lifeguard plunged in. After the man was safely on shore, shore the people began to chide the lifeguard and said, that was terrible, why didn't you jump in and get that man? He said, well, if I'd have plunged in when he was trying to save himself, he'd have drowned him and me. Some of you maybe are here tonight and you're trying to save yourself and you're thrashing around, thrashing around. You say, when will I be saved? When you quit trying to save yourself. Amen. When you quit trying to work. The Bible says to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace but of debt, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Listen, it's not do, it's done. It's not try, it's trust. It's not ongoing, it's finished. And we're saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that every person here tonight knows Christ through faith. I was talking to somebody recently and they said, I, I just can't trust Christ. I said, do you trust me? They said, sure. I said, well, that's nonsense. I don't even trust myself. <laughs> you trust me and you can't trust Christ? What do you mean you can't trust Christ? He's the only one you can trust. Amen. Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be ye saved. You say, what does it mean to trust Christ? If you were sinking in quicksand tonight, you'd, pull up, you'd grab every stick and every blade of grass, till you'd strip the ground around you. But when you'd wore yourself out and you see somebody there, you don't know whether they will help you, but they know they can, they can help you. And you look up to them with pleading eyes. If you want to be saved from your sin, the guilt of your sin, the power of your sin, the life of sin, and you have a repentant heart, and you look up to Christ with pleading eyes, you're not going to be saved, you are saved. May God bless you.